it, it's a projection screen when I do stuff like this. I just get to see all my shit show up, you know? In okay, fascinating interview between David Samuels, the interviewer, and David Garrow, the historian, author of Rising Star, a biography of Barack Obama. David Garrow also wrote an acclaimed biography of Martin Luther King. So David Samuels begins with a telling anecdote. So talking about Barack Obama and his most significant girlfriend, a woman who he invited twice to marry him. And uh, her name is Sheila. And she's gone on to become a professor. Sheila Miyoshi Jager, half white, half uh, Asian. And she's a scholar of uh, Korea. So Obama and Sheila are together at this point. I believe in the 1980s, they visit this art institute in Chicago where politics were being roiled by a black mayoral aide named Stephen Coakley in a series of lectures organized by Louis Farrakhan's Nation of Islam, accused Jewish doctors in the Chicago of infecting black babies with AIDS as part of a genocidal plot against African Americans. Now, imagine if this guy had been white, right? He would have been widely, widely condemned. So the episode highlighted a deep rift within the city's power echelons with some prominent black officials supporting Coakley and others calling for his firing. So in Jager's recollection, what set off the quarrel that precipitated the end of their relationship was Obama's stubborn refusal to condemn black racism, well, black hatred of Jews. So she acknowledged that Obama's embrace of a black identity. All right, so for Obama, being black was a choice, right? He didn't have to you know, identify as black, but he chose that identity, and that was already creating some distance between the couple. But what upset her that day was Obama's inability to condemn the comments of this Chicago aide who said that uh, Jewish doctors in Chicago were deliberately infecting black babies with AIDS. So she was bothered that uh, Barack Obama would not condemn anti-Semitism. Now, as Obama was developing his in-group black identity, it doesn't surprise me or particularly appall me that uh, Obama here would not condemn black anti-Semitism because the more you grow in your in-group identity, the less likely you are to condemn behavior by your in-group. So yeah, Obama did have an evolving black-based, race-based self-consciousness that distanced himself from Jager. But it's interesting to read Barack Obama's account of the breakup in his book, Dreams from My Father, against the very different account that Jager offers. So in Obama's account, he was the particularist, embracing a personal meaning for the black experience that Jager, the universalist, refused to grant. So in Jager's account, the poles of the argument are reversed. It is Obama who minimizes Jewish anxiety about blood libels coming from the black community. So his particularism mattered, hers did not. So Obama defined himself as a realist or a pragmatist, but the episode reads like a textbook evasion of moral responsibility. So Jager is something far more than a woman scorned by a man who had become president of the United States. So Obama asked her twice to marry him. She refused him both times. She's achieved her own high level of professional success. She's a professor of East Asian studies. Her scholarship is known for its factual rigor. By contrast, Dreams from My Father by Barack Obama is a work of dreamy literary fiction and a very poor attempt to document Obama's early life. So, the most revealing thing about Jager's account of her fight with Obama is that not one reporter in America bothered to interview her before David Garrow found her near the end of Obama's presidency. So I remember when I was living in Los Angeles, uh, after 2004, we had the first elected uh, Latino mayor of Los Angeles Antonio Villaraigosa, and the press was very reluctant to report anything damaging about him. So when I found out in June that uh, he'd ceased wearing his wedding ring for about nine months publicly, and I posted that on my blog, uh, that was the first time, even though many reporters you know, knew that uh, the mayor's marriage was over, that was the first time it was you know, published publicly. Then the LA Times responded, and then it became the number one story in California in, in 2007, because Gavin Newsom, the mayor of San Francisco at the time, was having his own marital issues. But they didn't want to report something damaging about LA's first Latino mayor in a century. So too, the news media weren't particularly interested in publishing anything damaging about Barack Obama on his way to power or during his time in power.
So you've got all these celebrated journalists who wrote popular biographies of Obama, became enthusiastic members of his circle, but uh, just had no interest in the woman who probably knew Barack Obama the best prior to Michelle. And uh, the, the character that Obama fashioned in his book, Dreams, has essentially been defined beyond the reach of normal repertorial scrutiny by America's journalistic elite. And David Garrow's biography of Obama, the only biography of Obama that I've read, Rising Star, is just filled with corrections of the historical record, corrections that uh, Obama more or less invented himself. So this book, Rising Star, highlights a remarkable lack of curiosity on the part of mainstream reporters and institutions about a man who almost instantaneously was treated by the media less like a politician and more like the idol of some cult. Let me get back to Mickey Carlos, Robert Wright. By the way, uh, related to the presidential election is, uh, so Gavin Newsom may debate Ron DeSantis? Well, they, they, they've, you know, there was an offer and acceptance. He offered to debate and DeSantis accepted. So but, in then, theory, but then Newsom's people suggested November. That's not soon enough. We, we need to get in the air this idea that there are alternatives to Biden. Right, right. I would think Newsom, Newsom would want to be one, right? I agree. I think Biden is putting the kibosh on it for the, re for the very reason we think it's good, because it shows there are younger people who are capable of the job and, uh, and puts Biden in a bad light. He wants to squash this. He, do he doesn't want to give DeSantis any air because he wants to run against Trump, and he doesn't want to give, make Newsom make him look bad. So I think Newsom postponing it is he got a call from the White House probably saying, I need to postpone this for a few months. Uh, so that's terrible, but it, it's inevitable. I mean, I mean, Biden has such an interest in stopping it. Well, sign up somebody else. Uh, interesting question in the chat. Is it wrong to divorce my disabled husband? Wife doesn't want to wipe and clean up and deal with his uh, crippled behind. Uh, not everyone's capable of uh, dealing with a crippled spouse. Obviously, it's the ideal, but uh, not everyone's up to it. Uh, painful. So the more disposable that uh, society sees marriage and, and treats marriage, right? We take cues from other people. So if it's expected that in sickness and in health, we'll stick with our spouse, then people will feel much more pressure to stick with their spouse when it's considered uh, much more socially acceptable to jettison your spouse if you can do better, then that's exactly what people will do. Yeah, see, see, here's the thing. I think there's a media hunger for somebody other than Biden. And this is perfect, though. Well, yeah, but there's a ton of people. Who, can't they find some semi-credible people to debate Ron DeSantis? DeSantis wants the airtime. Put well, him on a cable show, well, he'll show up. Well, Biden, well, yeah, he, I mean, Newsom is a particularly juicy opponent because the contrast between the gritty, impolite, unswathed DeSantis and the pretty boy, uh, suave Gavin Newsom might work to DeSantis' mm -hmm. advantage. They're the two states that hate each other that are competing. Newsom is the logical heir apparent. I mean, it's a perfect debate. It's hard to su substitute somebody better. But I Biden's going to stop. Biden here. is going to stop. You know, I, we don't have to debate Marianne Williamson. I mean, they're... they're, they're... So another... Th Thing that would shed light on the morality of this decision, do you stay or do you leave a crippled husband, is what was the quality of your relationship like? What is it like? And how has he treated you? Has he put a premium on taking care of you and protecting and providing for you? Or did he not thrive in, in those arenas? So the big reason that people cheat is often because of something that's going on inside a marriage. A big reason that people decide to leave a marriage is because of things that are going on in, inside the marriage. So I think it would depend on the particulars of that particular relationship, how moral or immoral it would be to leave it. So generally speaking, when people do something nice for us, we feel morally obligated to in turn do something nice for them. But when people consistently mistreat us, we feel less and less trepidation about cutting ties with them. Uh, there there isn't anybody who's credible enough who Biden won't want to stop. Well, we should put on our thinking caps and come up with somebody, and then you could use your connections uh, to Mogoland to get a message to DeSantis about whoever we decide should be the worthy debate opponent. I don't. Mogoland means Trump these days. I don't have. Oh, uh, I, don't, I don't have connections, Bob. I only have the illusion of connections. That's what I'm using the show for to propagate the illusion of connections. You know what? That's a segue to. Uh, no. Hunter Biden. Hunter, Hunter Biden. Hunter, the Hunter, Hunter Biden. It turns out. Well, that's, it turns out that's Joe's. That would be Joe's alibi, right? He was trying to foster the illusion of connection. No, the Hunter, oh. well, there's a bit of the alibi for both of them. Yeah. It came out, uh, Hunter's business partner testified that they, they had, Joe was put on speakerphone 20 times by Hunter in front of clients, sometimes without uh, His knowledge. necessarily knowing about it. Uh, mm. He had dinner with clients twice at Cafe Milano. Just walk in at Cafe Milano. So how powerful and influential is Joe Biden? And if Joe Biden isn't the most powerful person in the world right now, who is, who is the power behind Joe Biden? 
David Samuels writes about this in this Tablet Magazine article. So who's actually making decisions in a White House staffed top to bottom with core Obama loyalists? So when Obama turned up at the White House, staffers in the press crowded around him, leaving President Biden talking to the drapes. Not a metaphor, but a real thing that happened. So that Obama might enjoy serving as a third-term president, nor but name, running the government from his iPhone was a thought expressed in public by Obama himself, both before and after he left office. So with all these clues, the Washington press corps, fresh off their years of broadcasting fantasies about secret communications between Trump and the Kremlin, seem unable to imagine, let alone report on Obama's role in government. So Obama is incredibly detached and lazy as president of the United States. It's hard to believe that he's secretly pulling the strings behind the scenes of the Biden administration. So near the end of June, Politico ran a long article noting Biden's cognitive decline with the quay headline, Is Obama Ready to Reassert Himself? As if the ex-president hadn't been living in the middle of Washington, D.C. and playing politics since the day he left office. Over the previous weeks, Obama had continued his central role as advocate for government censorship of the Internet while launching a new campaign against gun ownership, claiming it's linked to racism. So surely the spectacle of an ex-president simultaneously leading campaigns against both the First and Second Amendments might have led an even a spectacularly incurious old school Washington, D.C. reporter to file a story on the nuts and bolts of Obama's political operation and on who was going in and out of his mansion. The D.C. press was no longer in the business of maintaining transparency. They had become servants of power whose job was to broadcast whatever myths helped advance the interests of the powerful. Well, when Trump was president, he was power, and the press wasn't particularly interested in broadcasting myths to advance his interests. Uh, Obama's campaigns against the First and Second Amendment haven't gained any traction. I don't think they strike anyone as particularly effective. That may be a big reason that they're not attracting more media scrutiny. There's another interpretation of Obama's post-presidency, and this is the one I share. Obama was never the leader of anything, neither during the Trump years nor now. Said he is focused on buying trophy properties, hanging out with billionaires, vacationing on private yachts, while grifting large checks from marks like Spotify and Netflix. Even as his now stratospheric levels of personal vanity demand that every so often he show up President Biden for the sin of occupying his chair in the White House. So, yeah, that strikes me as true. Obama is a celebrity-obsessed would-be billionaire, not so much a would-be American Castro, <laughs> reshaping American society from his basement. Yeah, I, I don't think Barack Obama is reshaping American society from his basement. Then David Samuel says, what I could never understand was Obama's contempt for the idea of American exceptionalism. Yeah, well, as a good liberal, as a good academic, someone who graduated from Harvard Law School, American exceptionalism will seem silly. So Obama insisted on poking American exceptionalists in the eye, saying he believed in American exceptionalism, just as I suspect the British believe in British exceptionalism and the Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism. So why would the President of the United States feel the need to disabuse his countrymen of the idea that they are special? Well, I suspect that Obama's contempt for this way of thinking is pretty much the norm among people with his type of elite education. That uh, David Samuels finds this strange is itself strange, right? The, the more left you go in politics, the less nationalist you go, right? The further left you go in politics, the more you believe in centralized rule by experts who come from places like Harvard, where Barack Obama graduated law school. Samuels writes, what made Obama's rejection of American exceptionalism seem particularly weird to me was his attachment to Abraham Lincoln, whose cadences and economy of language he urged his speechwriters to emulate. Well, Obama wanted Abraham Lincoln's reputation. Right? That doesn't mean he wanted all of Lincoln's beliefs that went with that. Right? They were political operators operating in different Americas at different times. Right? A time of war is a time of greater nationalism. So Lincoln was far more of a war president than Obama. Then David Samuels writes, Obama's hostility to American exceptionalism seemed linked to his hostility to Israel or American identification with Israel. Well, I think that is just a common sense position. America is more linked with Israel than is in America's best interests, and perhaps even in Israel's best interests. Obama was determined to reach an agreement with Iran that makes sense. The most likely cause of a nuclear war in, in the world uh, during Obama's second term was Iran. 
So why would you not try to reach an agreement to delay them getting nuclear weapons? Right? I think Obama was correctly seeking out America's best interests, reaching some sort of agreement with Iran. And I believe that Barack Obama got about the best deal possible with Iran. I didn't have strong feelings about the Iran deal to the extent I understand it. I think it was in America's best interests. So there is no objective reason for America to identify more with Israel than, say, with New Zealand. So I think that Barack Obama put an appropriate level of focus on the Iran deal to reduce the chances of some kind of nuclear conflagration in the Middle East. So David Samuels admits, I've never seen any evidence that Barack Obama had the slightest animus towards Jews as individuals, but from his denial of American exceptionalism, his sourness toward Israel, uh, well, that, that just makes sense, given the, you know, the, the complicated and intense relationship to the two countries that is against America's interest. Uh, there does seem to be some kind of awareness by Obama, the problem posed to his politics by Jews, problem posed by Jewish group survival, and their continuing insistence on Jewish historical particularity. I don't see that. Right? Obama has a left-wing perspective on life, which does not value religious states or ethnic states. So it makes sense to me that somebody on the left would not be a fan of the modern state of Israel, which is built on ethnic and religious identity. It doesn't make Obama a, a bad person. I, I think everyone on the left who, who believes that uh, states should not be built on racial and religious identity, again, have problems with the Jewish state. I suspect to Barack Obama, Jews are white, just as almost all Jews in America regard Jews as white. So David Samuels writes, ghettos were invented for Jews. Yeah, particular times and particular places. Concentration camps, too. How can Jews be privileged white people if they're clearly among history's victims? Well, every group can think of reasons why its group is a victim. So this isn't unique to Jews. If Jews aren't white, then perhaps a lot of other white people are also victims and therefore aren't white. Maybe black people aren't always or primarily black. Maybe the whole progressive race-based ideology is a load of crap, which is why the Jews remain a problem. I, I don't think Barack Obama has a big problem with Jews as a group. This just doesn't ring true to me, right? Every group feels itself a victim. All strong in-group identity depends in large part upon a sense of victimization or nationalism. Nationalisms depend upon a sense of victimization. Right? If you believe your group was victimized and deserves reparations from our groups, you're not going to be deterred or put off by the suffering of our groups. In the long run, there's a presumption that you're guilty of some sort of crime. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, I mean, you know, that's... So, so who had dinner twice? Hunter, so had dinner Biden, twice? Hunter had two dinners that Biden showed up at and actually ate a meal and talked to the people. They, they, Archer claimed that in all these things, they only talked about the weather and various, they never talked about business because the purpose was to brand Hunter uh, with the Biden name and, and to show that he could get Joe on the phone and to show that he was a Biden and to give the clients, he was selling the illusion of access to Joe. The, the, the Democratic line is he didn't actually have access to Joe. He couldn't actually get Joe to right. do things. Right. But he wanted the clients to think that. Okay, think about that for a while. Just even on its face, the best Democratic argument has Biden being the accessory to this fraud that his son was perpetrating on but these the unknowing accessory. The unknowing accessory, right? No, he's not an idiot. He knows when, when, the, when a Burisma, he's, he's a special envoy to Ukraine. When then a, he knows no, I'm Burisma not saying he wasn't knowing. There's a Burisma saying... guy at the dinner, and Hunter is, Hunter is he's a potential Hunter client. Biden, Joe Biden knows what's going on, okay? I'm not saying he doesn't, I, I, but I thought you began the sentence with something like the best Democratic case, the best argument Democrats can make, and I would finish that with, is that Biden was an unknowing. But there's, it's completely implausible that he was unknowing that Hunter was selling the illusion of access. Uh, that, well, wait, that, would, wait, that would imply wait. that he's such a moron that he shouldn't even, uh, you know, shouldn't hold any public. Okay, let's go back here to David Samuel's essay in Tablet. It says, I can make the case that Obama's public life was the amoral part, beginning with the toleration of genocide in Syria. So according to David Samuels, apparently the United States should not have tolerated genocide in Syria. So the United States apparently should not tolerate genocide everywhere. So we should just go around intervening militarily in all sorts of places far beyond our ability that would be completely against America's best interests. So for... David Samuels operating against America's best interests by militarily intervening in Syria is the moral thing to do. Then David Samuels is also upset with the extrajudicial killing of U.S. citizens. All right, these are U.S. citizens who are carrying out terrorist attacks against Americans. 
while operating overseas. I don't have a problem with killing them. Extending to wide-scale illegal surveillance and spying. And he has now become the spokesperson for gutting the First Amendment in favor of government censorship of large tech platforms. Well, Barack Obama's opinion on uh, gutting the First Amendment in favor of government censorship of large tech platforms is largely normal for people of his education and social class. I don't think there's anything extraordinary about it. I disagree with it, but that is the norm when you're part of the elite. All right, if you're an elite, you want to reduce criticism of your status as elite when you are striving to become elite and replace the current elites, you want more freedom of speech so that you can climb your way up the greedy, greasy pole. The defense of Obama is that he was never touched by scandal, meaning personal scandal. And you're like, well, I'm sure all those people who got gassed to death in Syria or growing up in American towns with no jobs feel just great about the fact that he never got a blowjob in the Oval Office. Uh, to the extent that there are American towns with no jobs, that's not primarily Barack Obama's fault. And if there are people who got gassed to death in Syria, I don't see how that's any worse than getting stabbed to death or shot to death. And I don't think it's America's job to prevent bad things happening in other countries in the world. It's America's job primarily to act in America's best interests. About this at all. I'm He's sitting here trying to figure out if it's possible for, if it's an illusion for Biden to know about it, but I guess you could say, he, the access is, is an illusion because Biden's not going to do anything that Hunter suggests, but Biden knows that Hunter is fostering the illusion right. that he does have right. influence right. over Biden. And he Biden so, but, uh, keep, keep in mind a couple, a couple of points. First, in Ukraine politics, everything depends, your status depends on do you have the blessing of the Americans because the whole country depends on America, the way right. the Irish rebels depend on America. So uh, just having Biden's name attached helps for reason, even if there's no illusion of access. Second, I think Biden's out is that he didn't get any money for it, okay? I think if he got money for helping perpetrate this fraud on Hunter's clients, mm -hmm. Game over. He's guilty of being accessory to a fraud. He should be impeached. But uh, it's not as bad as stealing the election, but it's, it's worse than Watergate, and it's bad. Uh, the, sec the, the second thing is, do we really think it stopped at the illusion of access? Wasn't there actual access and maybe actual results? There's not a lot of evidence of that. The two pieces of evidence that I have are, first, this old article from DC Examiner from, I think, 27, 20, 2007 or something, when Biden was a senator and Hunter had some clients that wanted to change the rules for credentialing chemical workers Okay, Biden intervened on behalf of Hunter's clients. Okay, he delivered. Not the illusion of access, the reality of access and the reality of influence successfully peddled. So Biden has delivered for Hunter before, even in that one example of this, that one example, how many others were there? The second. So uh, Half Kalishan in the chat says the Torah commands us to watch our free testosterone. This Robert Wright guy, when he talks more than 30 seconds, I feel my testosterone level starting to drop. Only the angry, assertive Jew, Mickey Kaus, restores my testosterone levels. Tucker Carlson kills my testosterone too, that high-pitched laugh and bow tie. No wonder the Fox shows raw supplements. So the guy on the right here is Mickey Kaus. The guy on the left is Robert Wright. So I popped my testosterone supplement uh, last night. And as a result, I had all sorts of lustful thoughts, which did not aid in the, in the quality of my sleep. The second thing is the mayor, what, widow of the mayor of Moscow uh, sent a big check to invest with Hunter's firms, of which they got a cut. Uh, and she wanted to be off the sanctions list, and she was not on the sanctions list. Now, it just, was it just a coincidence that she sent this money and she wasn't on the sanctions list, or was there some, uh, you know, uh, access, uh, successful influence peddling by Hunter? We don't know, but it's, it's possible. It's an avenue to explore. Uh, it's all we got at this point. But, uh, they, I, but whether or not that their access was actually peddled, I think if Joe got money, he's guilty. Uh, what, what I can say, basically. Uh, Half Galician says, look, the only testosterone supplements are red meat and push-ups. Well, I do plenty of push-ups and, and pull-ups. I'm starting to, starting to press against my shirts, right? My, my chest is expanding. My shirts are getting a little uncomfortably tight. So the testosterone supplement that I occasionally take may be just all in my head. It may just have a placebo effect. But uh, thank God for placebo effects. I'm down with the placebo. All right, back to... This uh, Tablet Magazine article. So what exactly does it mean that uh, Obama tolerated genocide in Syria? I mean, genocides are going on all over the world. It really isn't America's job to stop them when that goes against American best interests. Right? Obama approved the killing of U.S. citizens abroad who had turned their backs on America and were organizing terror attacks on Americans. So I don't have any problem killing them. Now, David Garris says... I think a major turning point in Barack Obama's presidency was where he and Dennis McDonough 
walk around the White House grounds, and Obama changes his mind about Syria. So Obama had said something stupid about Syria, saying that if the Syrian regime uses chemical weapons on their own people, that that'd be a red line, so presumably meaning the U.S. would intervene militarily. So it's one thing to say something stupid. We all say something stupid. Obama did the right thing in not following up saying something stupid by doing something stupid, which would have been far more stupid. So Obama changed his mind. He walked back his red line comments on Syria. And that strikes me as wise. And uh, then the article talks about Barack starts calling his ex-girlfriend Sheila again after David Garrow had uncovered her, right? He's calling her again because Obama needs to keep her close because she to knows too much of his story, how he invented himself, and she becomes a wild card if she no longer feels a tie to him. David Garrow says, when I started reading Barack Obama's book in early 2008, Dreams from My Father, and I thought, this is a crock. It's not history, it's all make-believe. Who knows what the real story is? David Samuel says, I've got the feeling from people close to Obama that his pose of being a writer is one that he refers in many ways to being a politician. So he doesn't want his writing leanness or his you know, fictional abilities to be revealed. doesn't want to be challenged. It's my story. I created it. I owned it. So Barack Obama, the prime mover, perhaps in the transformation of the American society we're living through now, according to Samuels, I don't see Obama as the transformer. I see him much more as a mannered observer, a huge narcissist who couldn't care less about anything outside himself. I, Obama struck me as too passive to move much of anything. He is that mannered observer and a narcissist. I think Barack Obama in the winter of 2008 realized there was no way that his presidency could live up to expectations. And even fanboy journalists acknowledge that it ended up being an underwhelming, disappointing presidency. It will be seen as a failed presidency because of the international failures. And so according to David Garrow, the number one legacy of the Obama presidency is going to be the failure to intervene in Syria and the failure to object to Russia taking Crimea and the Donbass in 2014. That's ridiculous. My God, I have no trust in David Garrow's judgment if he thinks that these are failures by the Obama presidency. But uh, David Samuel's got a good point here. He says the best way to understand Barack Obama is that he is a literary creation of Barack Obama, the writer, who authored the novel of his own life, Dreams from My Father, and then proceeded to live out this fictional character that he created for himself on the page. David Samuel says future historians are going to look back at the Obama presidency and see it as the moment when this new oligarchy merged with the Democratic Party, used the capacities of these new technologies and the power of this new class of people, the oligarchs and their servants, to create a new apparatus of social control. How far can they go with it? What are the limits? You see them testing this out every week or so. So was Barack Obama the author of this new machine? Did he create it purposefully or does it report back to him? I think all three suggestions there are absurd. But obviously, Barack Obama is not the author of this new machine. He didn't create it, and it doesn't report back to him. Now, I think David Garrow is absolutely right here. And he says, Barack Obama has no interest in building the Democratic Party as an institution. Never had any deep, meaningful policy commitments other than the need to feel and seem victorious. Obama is just as insecure as Trump, but in ways that are not readily perceived. And Obama is not someone who retains people. Uh, even Valerie Jarrett and David Axelrod only go back to like 2003. So the only person who has a little bit of a through line with Barack Obama is Rob Fisher, who's, David Garrett says, the brightest person I've met in my life. Rob would argue with Obama. And the second book, when Obama's trying to get it finished during the campaign, The Audacity of Hope, Rob tells him it's a mess and Barack Obama gets angry. You can't tell a U.S. senator that his book is a mess. So Rob would disagree with him in intellectual and academic ways. And Rob and his wife went to the White House a few times, but this was not a usual thing because Barack Obama does not want to be close with people who are his equals. So you see this with a lot of live streamers and gurus. They don't want friends as much as followers. Right? None of the people who are ostensibly Obama's best friends are anywhere close to his equal. 
you see how Obama got elected to the Harvard Law Review and to the presidency, and look at how he functioned as president of the Law Review to how he functioned as U.S. president, right? He's not a particularly ideological figure. He's got this distant light touch management system, has no investment in what the contents of the Harvard Law Review volume end up being. He doesn't write his own note. He's not interested in producing a work of legal scholarship. So for Barack Obama, the Law Review presidency is just like going to Harvard. It's a credentialing enterprise. It's not a personal investment in policy substance. Obama would be terrible on the U.S. Supreme Court because he's lazy. In the book Rising Star, Obama says, I'm fundamentally lazy and it's because I'm from Hawaii. Uh, Barack Obama once said to this man in Chicago, the only two things he wants in life are a valet and an airplane. Now, what was incredibly uh, weird about the Obama presidency and the excitement over him, that so many white people thought that this would be the cure for the legacy of American racism. Well, America's racial problems are primarily the result of the particular compositions of races in America and everywhere else in the world with these same compositions have similar problems. There was never any chance that President Barack Obama could solve America's racial problems. He did have the ability to make them worse, which he did, right? So we got the rise of Black Lives Matter in 2014. America's racial problems significantly got worse between 2008 and 2016. They particularly got worse between 2013 and 2016. So David Samuels is a smart and accomplished writer. Everything he publishes is thought-provoking, but he doesn't seem to be making much of an effort here to substantiate most of his points. He doesn't seem particularly interested to know much about what he's pronouncing on. His epistemics are lousy. He's essentially asking us to accept his points on faith. In his previous interview for Tablet, he essentially promoted JFK Jr.'s worldview. And then June 11, 2020, he published a story on Kevin McDonald that did not advance the story one inch. It was a complete waste that got no resonance, no mentions. So David Samuels refused to consider any of Nathan Coffness's penetrating essays on Kevin McDonald. He, David Samuels apparently hadn't even re read the Coffness critique, apparently hadn't even read Kevin McDonald's Culture of Critique book, and it's just an absurd essay interview. He writes, rural Oregon has many of the same problems as any American inner city except it is overwhelmingly inhabited by people with white skin. Really, rural Oregon has the same problems as American inner cities, right? He provides no evidence for this assertion. How on earth does rural Oregon resemble American inner cities? By which metrics, right? So the place he's talking about, Medford, Oregon, averages fewer than a murder a year, right? That's hardly inner city levels. 